Great, thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. It's a great pleasure uh, to see everybody here. My name is Karen Crosby. I'm a professor of gender studies at the University of Leeds. I'm one of the general editors of um, the Sociological Review. I'm also the co-editor of the monograph series. I'm going to be chairing the, um, the lecture today. It's a, a, a real pleasure and to be here and to welcome Professor um, Paige Alam. Um, and I'm, at this point, I'm going to hand over to, to Wesley, who's going to introduce uh, and begin today's event. Thanks, Karen. Dear friends and colleagues, good evening. Uh, I'm Ming Xiaodong, uh, Editor-in-Chief of the Sociological Review. Welcome to the Sociological Review Annual Lecture 2022. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, the Sociological Review Foundation team who have been working so hard behind the scene in organizing today's event, especially to our event manager, Danielle, our communication officer Karen, and our journal manager Kaoru. I also like to thank Professor um, Mikla Benson for leading the first um, the morning session on public engagement, and we'd like to thank Professor Rachel Murphy for acting as the discussant for tonight's uh, lecture. Rachel's work has been, you know, influencing and has influenced many international scholars in children, parenting and migration studies, and scholars in contemporary China studies. Tonight, uh, I'm delighted to welcome our speaker, Professor La Peijia from the National Taiwan University. I'm sure our audience are familiar with Peijia's work, especially her theoretical and empirical intervention in global sociology through her prominent work in the field of sociology of migration, gender and intergenerational relations. Peijia is active in promoting public sociology in relation to knowledge translation and communication. She sees herself as a translator in communicating global social inequalities within different community and sectors to a wide audience. In her recent interview with the Sociological Review, Peja highlights that research topics that she chose are motivated not only by academic curiosity, but also by political concerns. She also mentioned elsewhere that the aim of sociological knowledge production is not just for publishing in good academic journals, but for public interests. I know that people who have worked with Peja or have met Peja are inspired by her commitment to supporting a new generation of sociologists, including me. I remember I first met Pei Jiao when I was still a PhD student. I traveled from England to the United States to attend the ASA annual meeting in Las Vegas. Thanks to multiple hurricanes at that time, my flights were delayed and diverted. Um, luckily, I managed to present my work at the conference. Among the small audience for my panel, Pei Jia was sitting in the back. She raised her hand, asking me a question. I can't really remember what question she asked. <laughs> but I remember she came up to me after my presentation, telling me that it is a really interesting project. I was grateful for her kindness for attending my presentation and her encouragement when I was a steward, PhD student. The kindness and care means a lot to many early career researchers. I'm glad that our early career researchers today also had the opportunity to develop some meaningful discussion and conversation with Pei Jia during the workshop. So please join me in welcoming Professor Lan Pei Jia to deliver this year's annual lecture. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Okay, so the title of today's talk is Navigating Child Rearing, Fatherhood, and Mobilities, a Transnational Relational Analysis. The goals of this lecture are twofold. First, I propose the transnational relational analysis as a theoretical tool to examine how people raise children in multi-layered, multi-sided, transnational social field, involving the interconnection of different sources of mobility and immobility. Second, I apply the transnational relational analysis 
to examine three empirical cases of fatherhood. Fathers from the transnational middle class in Taiwan, male Taiwanese immigrant with professional jobs in the US, and working class Taiwanese men who enter cross-border marriages. So let me say a little bit about the theoretical framework. Two theoretical paradigms has dominated the study of parenting. First, parental values and ideas are considered cultural repertoires shared by ethnic groups that often persist over time. In Chinese culture, traditionally, while mothers were delegated the more nurturing aspects of day-to-day -day child rearing, Chinese fathers' central application were yang, which involves material provision for children and the whole family, and xiao, to instruct children in social etiquettes and knowledge, and act like as role models. In addition, the concept of guan, with connotation of both controlling and caring, describe Chinese parental authority accompanied by a great involvement in their children's life. However, ethnic repertoire do transform over time under intercultural influences. The idea of pay, which emphasizes parents' companionship and intergenerational emotional bond, has gained increased value for the development of a psychologically healthy child. The cultural transition toward intimate fatherhood or involved fatherhood echoes the Western image of the new father who is expected to become more nurturing and emotionally expressive with his children. Social class is the second dominant paradigm in the field of child rearing. Sociologists have long explored how parents' family origins and occupational cultures share their preferences and priorities in child rearing. And Neclaro, for example, has identified two class-specific cultural logics, the middle-class style of concerted cultivation and the working-class style of the accomplishment of natural growth. However, Laro's work has been criticized on many fronts, including downplaying the impact of race, overlooking differences within the middle class, and having limited discussion on the father's role in child rearing. Recent scholars have taken an intersectional approach to exploring how race, ethnicity, and class are relationally articulated through parenting, especially in the racialized strategy of concerted cultivation in middle-class and minority family. Researchers who study a variety of racial groups commonly found that these parents, the middle-class minority parents, look to successful co-ethnic instead of native-born whites as their role model in raising children. They also aim to achieve ethnic and social, racial socialization by cultivating racial sensibility, instilling cultural pride, and preparing their children for the skill of racial navigation. I highlight two issues that are glossed over in this emerging literature and require further attention. First, middle class minority fathers are reported to be actively involved in preparing children for high achievement education. We need to further explore how their fatherhood involvements are associated with their racial identity and immigrant status. Second, immigrant parents are found to use their countries of origin as a benchmark of measuring children's excellence or imagining children's future competition. But there is still a gap in the literature as to how immigrant parents mobilize transnational links for the purposes of class reproduction and racial socialization. 
So let me talk about uh, what I mean with transnational relational analysis. The scholars have used the approach of relational thinking to study the social fields of class inequality and racial stratification. The transnational framework further advances relational analysis by overcoming the pitfall of methodological nationalism which you see the nation state as a given unit of analysis. As critics had pointed out, class distinction do not take place in a relatively closed social system. Recent scholars also started to look into the global construction of race by examining how immigrants and return migrants negotiate cla racial classification and identities across home and host country. Peggy Levitt and Glick Schiller have proposed the groundbreaking concept, transnational social field, to describe how transnational exchanges of ideas, practices, and resources facilitate the simultaneity of family lives and kin networks live across national borders. They distinguish two practices in a transnational social field. Ways of being refer to the actual social relations and practices individuals engage in transnationally, while ways of belonging describe emotional practices such as memory, aspiration, and imagination that signal or enact a transnational identity. I would like to expand the above theoretical insights beyond migration study to capture the contemporary interconnected family lives. The approach of transnational relational analysis is critical for both empirical and theoretical reason. Empirically, Michael Douglas has coined the term global householding to describe a variety of situations in which the formation and the sustenance of household are increasingly reliant on the global movement of people and transaction among household members who originate from or reside in more than one national territory. Wealthy parents in the global south has long utilized international migration as strategy of Iowa Onco flexible capital accumulation, including parachute children who emigrate alone and geese families in which mothers accompany children studying overseas while fathers stay behind and visit from time to time. Global householding not only described the educational strategy of upper middle class family, but it also takes place at the lower end of the social class spectrum. In the last few decades, many working class men in Taiwan, Singapore, and South Korea have sought foreign brides from China and Southeast Asia. Both immigrant wives and their husbands engage in various transnational practices informing marriages and maintaining everyday family life. Theoretically, the transnational relational analysis offers a critical tool to examine three major issues. First, the transnational framework reveals how parents mobilize transnational flows of ideas, resources, and social connection to negotiate with local cultural repertoires and, so and educational regime. In particular, I use the term cultural mobility to describe the practice in which parents make use of time-space compression to consume cultural goods and services across ethnic cultural realm or spatial territories. Cultural mobility can take place in multiple directions, between the global north and global south, and between the sending and the receiving country of immigration. Second, Transnational relational analysis interrogates the emotional experience of global parenting in a relational manner, 
revealing visible and invisible links between those who move and those who stay behind. Finally, a transnational relation analysis offers a critical framework for examining how the spatial and the relational context enable and constrain the practice of fatherhood as a process of negotiating masculinity. Methodology. The transnational relation, the transnational framework of relational analysis requires a methodology that investigates the intersection of a different source of mobility and immobility at local and transnational scale. A multi-sided study that includes those who move and those who stay would be ideal. Even if these actors are not connected through tangible social networks, we could examine how the flows of ideas, objects, and information connect them across border and shape relations of aspiration, competition, and comparison. So this article draws on empirical data and analysis from a book project, Raising Global Families, which I published with Stanford in 2018. It was based on a multi-site study in which I conducted in-depth interview with over 100 families. One half of them resided in Taiwan, and the other half were immigrant family, originally from Taiwan or China, and reside in the US, Boston in particular. I maintain class variation in both samples. Here is how I measure social class based on education and occupation. So I started with the research design of cross-class, cross-national comparison. The cross-Pacific comparison allowed me to identify how the cultural repertoire of child rearing transformed a cross-border. And the cross-class sample in both Taiwan and the US added another layer of comparison for examining the class-specific capacity of cultural negotiation. In this article, I want to further illustrate that we could also take a relational approach to capture the interconnection between those differently situated parents. In the following, I will compile three different cases of child rearing and fatherhood to illustrate the application of transnational relational analysis. So let me start with the transnational middle class. This is a privileged segment of Taiwanese fathers who are mostly private sector professionals, such as engineers, managers, and lawyers. They play essential roles in globalized production, and many have overseas experience of study or work. They prioritize parents' responsibility to provide their children with education. Job, and engage in the strategy of concerted cultivation. They choose international, private, or charter school with Western curricula and send their children